Hello everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Cell-Free Methods for Producing Protein Microarray. I'm Julianne Chai of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar sponsored by Gizco, part of the Thermo Fisher Scientific. For more information, please visit, visit www.thermofisher.com slash protein expressions. We have a few important announcements before we begin. This webcast is designed to be interactive, and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them into the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of your presentation window or submit your problem through the green Q&A button on the lower left. This webinar has been approved for continuing educational credits. Please click on the CE button at the bottom left corner and follow the process to receive your credits. I would like to now introduce today's speaker, Dr. Joshua Labar. Joshua Labar is one of the nation's foremost investigators in the rapidly expanding field of personalized diagnostics. His effort focuses on the discovery and validation of biomarkers, unique molecular fingerprints of disease. Biomarkers can provide an early warning for those at risk of major illnesses, including cancer and diabetes. After Labar founded the Harvard Institute of Proteomics, he was recruited to ASU's Biodesign Institute as the first Piper Chair in Personalized Medicine in 2009. The Virginia G. Piper Center for Personalized Diagnostics applies open reading frame clones to the high throughput study of protein function. In addition, his group invented a novel protein microarray technology, nucleic acid programmable protein array, which has been used widely for biomedical research, including the recent discovery of a panel of 28 autoantibody biomarkers that may aid the early diagnosis of breast cancer. I will now turn it over to Dr. LeBaer for his presentation. Thank you so much, Julianne, uh, and uh, thank you to Thermo Fisher for inviting me to speak today. Uh, looking forward to telling you about some of the work we do here at the Biodesign Institute in uh, Arizona. Um, I'm going to uh, introduce this by starting to talk about um, the field of proteomics, which is the field that we're in. Uh, generally speaking, proteomics is a field in which uh, we study large sets of proteins, typically all the proteins in a cell or all the proteins in a proteome, but the goal is to do a high throughput study of protein and their function. There are two general approaches to proteomics. The first could be referred to as abundance-based proteomics. In this field, uh, samples are separated to separate out the proteins, and proteins are typically identified by mass spectrometry with the goal of assessing how much of each protein is present in a sample, and eventually comparing, let's say, samples from people with diseases to samples from, from healthy patients to see if there are differences. The type of proteomics that I'm going to be talking about, I would refer to as functional proteomics. And in this field, instead of looking at the proteins in a sample, we take clone copies of genes that encode proteins, produce those proteins, and study them in, uh, in a variety of functional approaches to look at how those proteins behave and how they, they misbehave in the context of disease. So obviously, if we're going to study clone uh, expressed proteins, we need to have available to us clone copies of the genes. And my lab and a number of other labs, particularly in the Orpheum collaboration, have begun building large collections of genes uh, in a format that we can use to produce the proteins. Uh, typically, these genes are captured in a gateway cloning system. And uh, each gene is flanked on either end with a recombinational uh, cloning site. And so you can see that here in this, uh, in this slide where you have your gene of interest right here in a master vector. And then using the recombinational cloning system, we can transfer that gene into virtually any other um, uh, vector, either individually or in high throughput. And so by building a library of uh, master clones, we now can put that library into just about any protein expression vector we want. Uh, typically, this is the kind of automation we use. Here you see a robot uh, transforming bacteria with 96 different genes in it, and the robot is now plating those bacteria 
on specialized auger plates. And here's a close-up view of that. Uh, these auger plates have separated into 48 different sectors, each sector representing a different gene. By putting two plates next to each other, we can do 96 at a time. And hopefully, you can see when you look closely at these images that um, there are little bacterial colonies on the plate here that we, that we can then pick using a specialized robot like this one that will pick individual colonies and allow us to um, isolate the various clones. All the clones in our collection have been um, uh, gathered together into um, a repository that we uh, refer to as uh, the FLEX repository that stands for Full Length Expression Ready. And our goal from the beginning has always been to make these broadly available to anybody who wants them without restriction in this flexible recombinational format. Uh, the clones have all been sequence verified and, and the goal of course is to make them affordable. Uh, this is a cartoon that we drew maybe 10 years ago when we first started this project. And this is what the platform looks like now. We have a, a large minus 80 degree freezer that stores around 855,000 samples. Uh, the clones are all captured in these two dimensions 2D barcoded tubes. And we have a website called DNASU. It's a nonprofit repository here at, at Arizona State University uh, that lists over 200,000 different plasmids. Uh, and then uh, people from all over the world can log onto that website. Uh, it's a little bit like Amazon.com for clones. Add them to your shopping cart and we ship them essentially at cost, uh, what it costs us to reproduce them. So um, this is, uh, we've shipped those now to uh, over, over 300,000 samples to over 50 countries and, and roughly 48 different states. So what I'd like to talk to you about now is one application that we, we have for using these clones in high throughput. That is to say, if, if you had a library, large collection library of genes, how would you use them to study the protein function? And the, the application I'm going to talk about is protein microarrays. Uh, this work was really started by Nero Ramachandran in the lab. Uh, Jeannie Hainsworth was the engineer who helped him, and, and then Shane, Alex, Sahar, and, and Jacob uh, all contributed to these early experiments. So um, on this slide here, I'm showing you the first published protein microarray. Uh, very nice work from Gavin McBeth at Harvard. And um, on this array, there are 10,000 features. And as you can see in the little inset there, uh, there's the protein that he was looking for in red. Now, uh, the most common way that people make these protein arrays is that they purify the proteins and then print them on the array surface, um, at, which is exactly what Gavin did. And of course, uh, to, um, although this array had 10,000 features, there were in fact only two proteins on this array, 9,999 spots of one protein and one spot of the other protein. And that's because if he wanted to print 10,000 different proteins, he would have had to do 10,000 protein purifications. Now, um, there are folks like Amju and others who do that kind of high with protein purification, but there are inherent challenges to that. Uh, first and foremost is that the yield that you get for different proteins varies dramatically, often over several logarithms, uh, with the majority of proteins being relatively low yield, uh, but then some proteins having higher yield. The other problem is that once you uh, purify the protein, you then have to store it until you're ready to print it. And then you have to print it, and then you have to store it again after it's been printed. And that kind of long-term storage is not necessarily conducive to well-retained folding of all the proteins on the array. And for that reason, our lab came up with a different approach, which is illustrated here. Uh, what we do is, instead of printing the protein, we print the cDNA that encodes the protein. And that cDNA has been configured to have, uh, in frame, a tag at the C-terminus that um, is a common purification tag present on all the proteins that we clone. And we use the recombinational cloning system to add those epitope tags to the ends of all the genes. Uh, along with printing the DNA that it codes the protein, we print a capture reagent that's gonna recognize that purification tag on the end of the protein. So that when the protein's made, it'll capture the protein through, the, through uh, grabbing that tag. Now the arrays that we print, as shown here, are effectively DNA arrays, and they can be stored at room temperature for months at least, uh, as long as we keep them in iris. And then on the day that we want to do the actual protein experiment, we use a cell free expression lysate that both transcribes and translates the protein in situ on the array. And as soon as the protein's made, it gets captured through the tag on the end of the protein. Of course, we like to put the tag at the C terminus because it means if we've captured the protein, 
you translated the full length of the protein. So this slide here indicates some early data. Uh, this is one of the earliest arrays we ever printed, uh, showing eight proteins printed 64 times each. Uh, and all of them, in this case, have a, a GST tag at the C terminus. And so to check the level of protein levels, we can use an anti-GST antibody. And because there's one GST tag for protein, um, this effectively allows us to get a relatively stoichiometric measure of how much protein we've produced. Of course, if we broke the array with an antibody specific to only one of those proteins, then of course, you'd only see that one protein. So the general approach here um, has a number of advantages. First of all, we don't have to do any expression and purification of proteins. So we avoid all of that cost and time in, in involving purifying proteins. Um, we get very highly consistent protein levels, which I'll show you in a moment. And of course, now with the availability of this HeLa cell extract from Philip Fisher, we can make these proteins in a human mill use. So if we're making human proteins, we can make those human proteins using human ribosomes uh, and human chaperone proteins, which gives us the best possible chance at natural folding. Um, another big advantage, of course, is that we're making the proteins just in time. So the proteins are made literally an hour or so before we test them. Uh, and they're kept in physiological buffer the entire time. Um, because we're making this from DNA, it, it means that if we can get access to the cloned copy of the gene, we can make the protein. And since cloning genes now have become quite routine, we can make all kinds of proteins. And to date, we've probably tested easily more than 30,000 different proteins on these arrays with a very high success rate, certainly above 95%. So um, this is an example of one of the earliest arrays we've uh, made. This is a, uh, one of our first published arrays. Uh, what you're looking at is an array of, of the DNA pre-replication complex proteins. Uh, every protein on this array is printed in duplicate. So you can see here in the, in the, top, in the top right corner um, that you work one, two, three, and four protein which is present in duplicate. There's one copy, and here's the other copy. Of course, now that we've printed this array, we can probe this array with another protein to see which proteins it binds to. And that's shown here. In this case, we printed, um, we co-printed the MCM2 protein along with, uh, along with the, all the other proteins on the array. Here's the MCM2. And um, you can see that uh, this protein binds to a number of proteins on the array. Oops, let me go back to this, close that out. Um, and uh, you can see that it binds to ORC5, ORC6, and MCM3, uh, and you can, and as well as MCM5 and MCM7. So um, that, that array that I showed you just there was, uh, was one of the earliest arrays that only had a few dozen proteins on it. So in the last couple of years, we've spent a little bit of time de developing this technology so that we could work at, um, at full scale. So um, what I'll show you now are some of the uh, results of that approach. So typically now our arrays look like this. Um, on the left, you can see an array that has around 2,400 features on it. Um, we stain the array with pico green, and that indicates how much DNA we printed. So that acts, acts as a control for DNA printing. And then to the right, you see that we've expressed that uh, array uh, and tested it for protein levels using the GST antibody, as I described earlier. And if you analyze the proteins on the array, what you'll see is that um, just about all proteins print well. Uh, between the two green lines is a, is a single logarithm of difference. So all of our proteins are expressed within a log of each other. And in fact, 93% of our proteins are within twofold of the mean. So um, we have very, very consistent levels of proteins. You'll also notice that uh, we can make membrane proteins, transcription factors, kinases, um, proteins that are large, small, and medium in size. Uh, the largest to date that we produce is around 350 kilodaltons. Um, I, will, I will add that although we know we can express and display membrane proteins quite well, it's a little bit hard to comment on the folding of particularly membrane proteins that make multiple passes through the membrane. So it's possible that seven, you know, seven transmembrane proteins uh, may not be well folded. We just don't know yet. Uh, we don't have any good experiments to test that yet. This just gives you some sense of the methodologies we use to do the DNA purification. Uh, this is the old approach we used, which was sort of a workstation automation using liquid handling robots. 
uh, typically connected by sneaker net, which is graduate students and postdocs carrying samples from one robot to the, the other. Uh, more recently, we installed this uh, DNA factory, which is a fully automated platform that does DNA mini preps. Uh, it can process 4,600 mini preps in about 70 hours. And that goes from growing the colony all the way to getting purified DNA. And that whole process is done without any human intervention. This slide just reminds me to tell you that um, although most of what we do uses full-length proteins on the arrays, um, for a variety of purposes, it's very easy to work with parts of proteins. Here, um, Rodrigo Bardera is one of the postdocs in the lab, was trying to map the epitope binding site of an antibody to B53. And you can see over here on the left that he made a series of N-terminal deletions of the protein right here. And you can see correspondingly that the antibody bound to all of these, and then it cut off and stopped binding at this point right here. Similarly, he came in from the C-terminus of the protein, and you can see that um, the antibody bound to these guys right here, and then it stopped binding at that point. He could also take, use PCR to generate a series of tile fragments for the protein here, and found that the antibody bound to only that one fragment. So in one single experiment on the array, you could map the binding site to within 16 amino acids. So that kind of approach is relatively straightforward, particularly if you also want to include a series of point mutants or other variations of a protein and run with for binding at those different variants. So um, probably the most important thing that's happened recently in the development of our technology was uh, uh, the recent release of this uh, human HeLa cell free extract. Um, uh, up until recently, we've been making our arrays using um, rapid particle site lysate, um, which, which, when we did it, um, would give us pretty good results. That's shown here. Um, on the left here, this slide uh, shows what rapid particle lysate did for protein production. Um, however, when we switched to the human helo cell lysate, which the, the idea we like because we're making predominantly human proteins in our studies, uh, and we like it using uh, the same uh, ribosomes in the same chaperone proteins, um, the yield improved dramatically. So that's shown here. You can see that um, it went up at least 15 fold for us. The other big advantage for us was that um, uh, that because this lysate was made from a, from a cell line instead of individual animals, then there was much less lot to lot variation. And so every time we got a batch, um, we got uh, very similar results. And an advantage that we have not anticipated, but nonetheless has been very welcome, uh, is shown here. Here we're looking at immune responses to proteins. And on the, on the left, uh, we're looking at uh, uh, a patient response uh, before and after vaccination. And you can see that when we made the proteins using the rabbit lysate, we just didn't get any strong immune responses. On, on the right, when we use the human lysate to make the protein, we got very clear discernible immune responses like this one here. Everything with an arrow was one of the predicted responses in this vaccinated patient. And I think the difference may be that in the, the rabbit lysate, which comes from rabbit blood, there may be interfering factors that block antibody responses on the arrays. Whereas with the lysate that comes from cell free, from, from the tissue culture lysate, um, I think those things are not present. And so we've gotten much more consistent antibody responses using the human lysate. So um, this is just to also remind me to mention that if anybody's interested in using this technology and uh, doesn't feel up to making their own arrays, although we've published all the methods uh, and, uh, and we've even uh, produced videos about how to do the methods, but some people don't feel up to wanting making their own arrays, we now have a nonprofit core facility indicated um, up in, the, uh, in this, uh, if you look up here, you can see the website where it's located. It's NapaProteinArray.org. Uh, as I mentioned, it's a nonprofit, and we're happy to work with anybody who wants to produce these arrays uh, and use them in their own research. One of the nice things about these arrays, of course, is that because they're based on cDNAs, um, they're easily customizable. Um, we can print you know, a group of proteins that all begin with the letter C, or we can print a set of kinases, or whatever it is people want to do, uh, we can produce those arrays. OK. so. Um, let me just tell you a couple of examples of how we've used them. Um, this is work looking at immune applications, and I'm especially going to feature here 
uh, work by um, Wagner Montour uh, and a, a little a bit of work from um, Nero Ramachandran uh, and, and Karen Anderson as well. So um, one of the first ap applications for using these arrays involved looking at antibody responses. So the classic way to measure antibody response is to use the ELISA assay in which you add a protein to the wells of a 96 well dish and then add patient serum to each of those wells. And if there's a strong response, then you'll see that response in a well like this one when there's a strong response. And if there's no response, then you'll get a well with no response. Of course, the, the challenge here is that, um, that this approach um, requires a lot of protein to coat the wells of the dish, and, it, and you're really only testing one protein at a time. So the ideal circumstance would be to take an array that has 2,000 or more proteins on it, probe that array with patient serum, and you'll see all the individual proteins that light up on that array. And of course, if you want to compare one set of arrays, which are identical, uh, and treated with, with patient serum to a different set of arrays that um, comes from controls, you can look for only those features that show up on the patients and not the controls. And that'll allow you to identify in one step which proteins are specific to anomalies. So our, the first time we did this, we focused on infectious disease. On the left here, you see the entire proteome printed of Francis cell tularensis, which causes tularemia. In the middle, you see a set of arrays that covers the entire proteome of Vibrio cholera. And on the right, you see a, a subset array of all the other membrane proteins from the organism Pseudomonas originosa. Pseudomonas is, a, is an opportunistic pathogen. In most healthy people, it doesn't cause any problem at all. But in patients with cystic fibrosis, it's the leading cause of death. Uh, primarily due to pseudomonal pneumonias. So we were working with Steve Laurie at Harvard Medical School on trying to develop, um, identify which proteins on the surface of this bacterium were most likely to induce a strong immune response. And the original approach that Steve wanted to take was to purify the membrane proteins, print them and measure them. But purifying membrane proteins is very difficult. So we convinced him to try the protein array approach. And here's, that's shown here. On the far left, you see the array stain for Pico Green. That just shows that we got the printing. In the middle, you see a GSD stain that showed that all 300 proteins made, uh, showed very strong yield on the arrays. And then under serum, you see that we can identify proteins to which that patient made strong antibody responses. So having done that with one patient, then we could do a series of patients. And here you see um, on the left, a series of patients with cystic fibrosis, all of whom had um, pseudomonal pneumonias. And if you start staring at these, these arrays long enough, you'll start to see responses um, that are common to many patients. So this pair of spots here, which is one protein, shows up in all of these arrays. You see it again here, you see it again here, and so on. Uh, and so from this then you can make a table that indicates um, patients in columns and antigens in rows. And if you look carefully at sort of this top set of antigens right up here, maybe this, let's say top one, top dozen, um, those, those, those proteins have corresponding antibodies in numerous patients, both um, cystic fibrosis patients and non-CF patients. So those would be the, the um, proteins that we would focus on for developing a diagnostic test or maybe even a vaccine if those proteins in, induce a protective effect in the antibody. One, one point worth mentioning here is that there was no single antigen that worked for everybody. Um, pretty much to cover every patient, you would have to use a mixture of antigens because different individuals have different immune repertoires and they make different antibodies under different circumstances. So um, we then thought to take this approach to a uh, um, uh, more chronic disease approach. In this case, we're looking for autoantibodies in breast cancer. My own background is that I'm a medical oncologist, so finding blood tests for cancer would be very advantageous. Uh, we focused on breast cancer because even though uh, there's a good screening technology and mammography, it doesn't get everybody, and a lot of women don't get mammograms. Um, I want to point out that this work was done with uh, regular collaboration with uh, Karen Anderson, a longtime colleague of ours, uh, also um, started by Sahar Sabani, uh, but then um, uh, Ji Wang and Ji Cho uh, both did a great deal of work 
Eric Wallstrom is our biostatistician, and um, the work on triple negative breast cancer was helped significantly from Janine Figueroa at NIH. So um, the, the application that we're thinking about involves looking for autoantibodies, and it turns out that cancer patients make antibodies against tumor antigens. Now, we don't entirely know what makes a tumor antigen a tumor antigen, but it seems to be a protein that encounters the immune system in a cancer patient that doesn't do so in a healthy person. And um, they can induce antibodies in patients even before their cancer is presented. So this gives us an opportunity to find a response that might be detectable in early disease and therefore a useful blood test. Now there's some reasons why we might want to use antibodies. First of all, even if the antigen that's released by the tumor disappears from the blood, the antibody response to that protein is still present. In addition, um, antibodies can amplify the signal of these proteins, uh, in part because uh, uh, even though there's a small amount of antigen in the body, you know, the antibody response to that is usually robust. And of course, antibodies are easy to measure in serum samples, so it's an ideal reagent to use in a study like this. And this is what we're looking for in the study. We're looking for um, responses in patients that are obvious by these dark black dots that are missing in the controls. Uh, but before we did the study, we wanted to make sure that the platform was reproducible. Um, and this is a typical response plot where we used the same sample on two different arrays on two different days. And they show very good agreement. In fact, every time we did this experiment, we included the same positive control on every day and looked at it compared to every other day. And if, if the differences were less than 95% correlation, we excluded the data from that day. Uh, and here you see that example. Here you see five different days uh, or six different days of the same control sample and a plot of the correlation coefficients. But this is typically how we would look at individual spots. I think you could appreciate here's um, a patient responding to a pro both spots of the same protein. And you'll notice that the other case responds to the same protein, but the controls uh, do not respond to that, that, that protein. So the study design that we used is shown here. Um, we did it in three phases. In the first phase, we compared 50 cases to 50 controls, um, typically looking at around 5,000 different antigens. In this case, the controls were uh, uh, healthy women coming from mammography. Um, from that 5,000 antigen study that we did, we identified 760 some patient, uh, antigens that looked like there was a response. And then using the, a, a separate array for just those antigens, we compared 50 cases to 40 controls. In this case, the controls were women with benign breast disease. Um, and from that study, we identified around 119 antigens that we then studied in yet a third set of cases and controls. All three sets were independent. And this one in phase three, we did blinded, so we didn't know which was the case of control, and we used the threshold values set in phase two. And from that, we identified a 28 antigen panel that um, were predictive for breast cancer. Uh, those antigens are shown here. Um, typically, the sensitivities range from around 10% up to 40% um, at 98% specificity. Uh, uh, since then, these antigens have been licensed to a company called Protista Diagnostics, uh, and they've incorporated them into a blood test that they're now that they've now released on the market called Medessa, um, uh, and this marker looks is doing very well in in uh, two additional prospective clinical trials using these um, using these markers, and so um, we're very happy to see that the early work that we've done in this diagnostics is now playing out into something that could be translated into uh, a product that people can actually use. So I want to just kind of uh, wrap up here a little bit with a couple of functional studies to show that you can do things with these arrays other than just uh, screen for autoantibodies. Uh, and this is work that includes uh, some work from Fernanda Festa uh, and Xiaobo Yu and Benita Ralph in the lab. The first example I'll mention is looking at kinases. Uh, here you see an array of protein kinases. In this case, the proteins have a flag tag on them instead of GST. And you can see that they light up quite well. Take that same array and, and probe it with phosphotyrosine antibody. Some, but not all of the kinases light up. And that's because some of these kinases are phosphorylated on tyrosine. And you won't be surprised to know that the majority of those 
are actually tyrosine kinases. So the question was, how did they get phosphorylated? Well, one possibility is that the lysate that produced the proteins phosphorylated them. The other possibility is that because these are kinases, they might be autophosphorylated. So to get at that question, we took the same array that had been phosphorylated and dephosphorylated it with phosphatase. And uh, this is what that array looked like after phosphatase treatment. You can see that all the, all the phosphates are gone. And then to the same array, then we added ATP, and all the proteins got rephosphorylated. Uh, and what this tells us is that the kinases on the array are themselves active, and that they, they self-phosphorylate in place on the array. Uh, and it means that even after they've been printed and expressed, that they're well-folded and functional. This also gives us the opportunity now to study kinase activity in real time using the arrays and using inhibitors of those kinases. And that's what's shown on this next slide. Here you see an array, and I'll, I'll draw your attention first to um, this uh, protein TNK2, which is our control protein. It's a kinase that when treated with imatinib, um, is not showing any um, significant decrease in activity, even up to 10 micromolar. But look at the activity of BCR ABL, the target of that kinase. You can see that um, without any drug, it's not inhibited, but in the presence of drug, it's significantly inhibited. And so um, this allows us then to use on these arrays selective drugs to block kinase activity uh, and ask questions like, do certain mutations make a, uh, a kinase resistant to drug or can we find off-target effects of kinases, of the drug on other kinases? Um, a second uh, functional approach was work that Chabot-Yu did. That was from on the FESTA, by the way. Chabot-Yu was looking for targets of a kinase, of, of an enzyme called an ampelator. Uh, it's like kinase, but not quite. Typically, kinases take gamma phosphate off of ATP and attach them to serines, threonines, and tyrosines. In the case of an ampelator, it takes the adenosine monophosphate from ATP and attaches that to proteins. And Kim more than others have shown that a, a number of different infectious bacteria will use these enzymes to modify host proteins in order to take over certain pathways in the host cell. The problem has been that it's been very difficult to identify what the targets of these uh, uh, ampelators are. Uh, people have tried mass spec approaches. They've tried pull down antibodies and after a number of publications, there have only been five proposed targets and, and, uh, and only one confirmed one. So um, what Shabo decided to do was to take advantage of click chemistry. Uh, he he uh, used some, uh, a reagent developed by the Wong lab that looks like this right here, which is an alkyne modified ATP. And then by adding that modified ATP together with an ampelator enzyme, the, the AMP then gets added to certain proteins on the array. And here you see the AMP getting added to the protein on the array. And because there's this alkyne group right here, you can add a rhodamine labeled azide, which will then with click chemistry, now label the targets that have been ampelated by the enzyme. So um, here typically was what the uh, experiment would look like take the array, stain it with DNA to show that it's, a printing is good, express the protein, and then in the context of the ampelators, we had to remove the DNA because the DNA presence was blocking ampelation. Um, and so, as you can see here, uh, Shabo was quite successful at removing all the DNA on the array. But despite removing the DNA with DNAs, the proteins were still present. So if you stain the array after removing the DNA, you can see that there's still plenty of protein on the array. Now what he's got is essentially sort of a naked protein array, and using that approach, um, he showed that he could get very good reproducibility from array to array. And here's what those data look like. So if you treat an array with just buffer alone, nothing lights up. If you treat the, the array with um, uh, different ampelators, now you start to see little tiny spots lighting up on the array. I'm just gonna zoom in on those a little bit. These are some of the proteins that lit up as potential targets of the array. So he went through about 10,000 different human proteins and identified all the different substrates on the array like this. And then using a solution-based uh, uh, confirmation story, he um, confirmed these in a separate set of experiments. But this just shows that using this array approach, 
uh, he was able to identify a number of additional targets that had not been previously identified for any of these uh, um, uh, amyloid proteins. Um, the last thing I'll mention is, is um, efforts that we're now doing uh, to try to modify proteins on the array to, to add post-translational modification. Um, in rheumatoid arthritis, for example, patients uh, produce antibodies against citrullinated proteins. It's a modification of arginine that creates a, a kind of an amino acid called citrulline. Uh, and it's common in the context of rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, to do this, we've kind of modified our waveform a little bit. Instead of printing the DNA on a flat surface, we print it in, the, in tiny nanowells, printed in a PDMS array format. We then add the HeLa cell lysate to the array and produce the proteins. And the proteins, um, we cover the array with a cover slip right here that has coded on it the capture agent for the protein. So now the DNA is at the bottom of the well, but the protein is captured on the roof of the well on the, um, uh, on the cover slip. Uh, what this then allows to happen is that we can then take the cover slip off the array and the cover slip then becomes this very clean surface that displays just the individual proteins captured on the glass. And that, that protein on the glass then becomes uh, a very useful um, substrate for doing post-translational modification. And so we can add enzymes to post-translational modified proteins, including glycosylation enzymes or um, enzymes that uh, create citrulline, for example. Uh, here's an example of an array that's been treated with a pad enzyme to create citrulline. On the left, you see the array that's been citrullinated. On the right, you see the native array. Um, you can see that these patients generate antibodies to the citrullinated protein that do not recognize the native protein. So this opens up a whole new possibility for us to screen for antibodies on proteins that have been modified by, by post-translational modification. Um, these these uh, Nano wells can be uh, uh, created in using photolithography, as shown here. Um, we can make very tiny wells. Uh, you can see these wells with the scanning EM right there. Uh, and so uh, that allows us to increase the density of these arrays dramatically to the point where um, we can actually uh, print, uh, we've currently printed up to 10,000 spots per slide, but in theory we can actually reach 20,000. And using the platform that we've generated, uh, we get very, very clean responses with, with no trans well diffusion from well to well, as shown there, with an antibody specific to just one protein. Uh, we use this approach to produce the image you see here. Uh, we printed different amounts of DNA that express the P53 protein, express the protein, and then stained it with antibody. And by using different amounts of DNA in the wells, we get, hopefully, you can see the, this image of a tiger's face which is essentially just a developed version of a protein array expressing P53 protein. So um, I, this can bring me to the end of my talk. Um, uh, here are a number of funding agencies that have been very supportive of our lab, uh, including the EDRN at NCI, uh, NIGMS at BSI that helped us build a lot of our clones, uh, the BCRF that supported us a great deal for the breast cancer that I've talked about, and some of these other organizations. Uh, and I've tried to mention as I went along all the different collaborators of our group, and um, with that, I want to bring it to the people who actually did the work. This is the lab that we have here in Arizona. Uh, uh, they do all the work I get to talk about. So now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop, and um, I think there may be some questions coming over the internet here. Thank you for that informative presentation. Before we get started on the question and answer session, I would like to remind our audience how to submit questions. You can submit questions by typing them into the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. And our first question is, what specific types of protein modifications or protein-protein interactions have been readily identified using NAPPA array technology? Okay, um, yes, thank you for that. Um, you know. Yeah, so um, I indicated some of the, um, uh, uh, as I went through, I talked about some of the protein interactions. Um, it'd probably be difficult to list all of those because there have been a number of studies now 
looking both at host uh, bacterial interactions as well as just uh, mammalian mammalian protein interactions. In terms of protein uh, post translational modifications, uh, we think that the helolysate to some extent adds phosphates to some of the proteins. Uh, we've certainly done, uh, we've certainly treated our arrays with kinases to generate phosphorylation. That works quite efficiently. Um, I mentioned that we've done some citrullination on the arrays. We've also done some uh, glycosylation, which I didn't show. Um, and uh, I, I think that's most of what we've done. Uh, I can't speak for other groups that have tried this as well. But I think once we make these sort of clean protein arrays, if you, if you have an active enzyme that modifies proteins, it's pretty straightforward to, uh, to do the modification. Are there specific, oh, excuse me. Are there specific DNA panels available or are arrays custom made? The mic back. Yeah, so the question was, are there specific DNA panels um, or are the arrays custom made? And the answer is both. Um, uh, I think probably the most common array that people want is the, the kind of whole human proteome array. Uh, the studies I showed today typically were done with around 10,000 human proteins. More recently now, our numbers have risen and we're closer to somewhere between 14 and 15,000 different proteins on the array. So uh, we're covering close to three quarters of the human proteome. Uh, we're working busily to try and get all the rest of the clones. Uh, but one of the beauties of the technology is it's quite easy to make custom arrays. Uh, because all we have to do is rearrange the plasmids, which can be done very easily in a, um, uh, uh, either, either using a liquid handling robot or the freezer that I showed you automatically delivers clones in whatever order you tell them. So it's very easy to make a, a custom set of genes and then print the array because we just print the DNA and then make the protein. So we do custom arrays all the time and that's, that's pretty easy. Has the one-step human-coupled IVT kit improved the NAPPA technology? Yeah, the, um, the helolysate has been a huge help for us for a couple of reasons. Well, first of all, of course, it needs to be a one-step process for us because uh, there's really no way on these arrays to first make RNA and then wash away the lysate and then make protein because the key is keeping the RNA and the protein all in one spot. So we needed a one-step reaction to be able to do this uh, efficiently. But I think, you know, uh, since we've switched to the, the helolysate, I think the advantages for us are, first of all, we make a lot more protein. Uh, the second advantage has been that um, there's very little lot-to-lot -lot variation, in fact, really not detectable. So that means that once you work out the platform and the method, uh, you can pretty much just repeat it over and over again. And that's, that's been huge. Uh, using lysates that come from animals um, was really problematic for us because every time we would work out the protocol on one lot from one animal, we would have to change it when we got the next lot. And I guess the third advantage I mentioned in my slides was that um, uh, I, I think that lysate's a little bit cleaner in terms of having things that block immune response. Uh, sometimes we were seeing problems with retic lysate where we just wouldn't see immune responses that we'd seen with the previous lot. Because that's just not been a problem with the uh, with the helo cell I say. Is the DNA SD DNA content available for public using it for assays other than NAPA arrays? And if so, turnaround time. Yes, all of our clones are available to anyone. Um, that, that's been uh, one of the principles of building that collection from the beginning. Uh, we distribute all of the clones uh, at cost. One of the um, advantages of that is if, for example, someone discovers an interesting protein on a protein array, the identical DNA clone that was used to make that array is also available as a plasmid. So people can order that plasmid at cost and then do experiments on that protein 
that they produce locally in their lay, and possibly even using the same email cell lysate, but now in a tube format instead of on a protein array. So um, yeah, all those ones are available. They're at the DNASU website. In fact, if you just type those five letters into Google, D-N-A-S-U, you'll, you'll get to the website and uh, all those clones, as I said, either as a full set or as individual clones or, or individual subsets. Okay, we have time for one last question. Like the array service, do you have one for a custom protein expression service? If not, does Thermo have one? Yeah, so the question was about um, a custom protein expression service. Um, we don't really do that. Um, as a general rule, we, we do have a, a facility within the university that has been doing that as part of a, a production team for a structured group. And so we're developing that method now. Um, I don't know if Thermo Fisher has a custom protein expression service. I would not be surprised if they didn't. Um, they'll have to answer that. Uh, but we don't really do that as a, as a core facility. I would like to once again thank Dr. LeBaire for his presentation. Do you have any final comments? Uh, no, real, no real final comments, just uh, thanks very much for listening and uh, people are free to contact us up here at ASU if they ever have questions or are interested in using the arrays. Uh, we're happy to teach you how to do it and do it yourself or we're happy to help you do it ourselves at our own core facility. However you want, we're, we're happy to help you. I would also like to thank GIBCO, part of Thermo Fisher Scientific, for making today's educational webcast possible. Today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through November of 2016. You will receive an email from LabRoot alerting you when this webcast will be available for replay. We invite you to forward the announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. See you next time and goodbye.